So we're now entering um, the second of today's sessions. We've got three talks. Uh, one uh, in Imabe project talk to kick us off, and then two talks from external speakers, one on uh, monitoring and one on um, a, a discrete macro element uh, method analysis. But the first uh, talk is a local talk uh, from colleagues from Imperial College Cook. London on high fidelity uh, modeling of mismatch bridges. So take it away, Mohammed. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Mohammed, and me and uh, Dr. Grossman will be talking today about uh, the high fidelity uh, simulations for masonry arch bridges. So, first, I believe you became familiar with this figure. So, just to locate how, how this pre presentation. Uh, represents for the Ermabi project. So in this presentation, yeah, we are focusing on the detailed modeling section. This section represents the basis for yesterday's presentation about the multi-level uh, assessment. So yeah, the outline for the presentation, we will show some uh, modeling capabilities uh, that we uh, have in the computational structure mechanics group. Then we will show the calibration for uh, material parameters that we used uh, in the high fidelity models. Afterwards, we will show uh, an extensive uh, validation for uh, our models based on previous and the current project. And this would, would include uh, some of the <laughs> some investigation for the 3D failure. Uh, mode. And we will conclude with uh, the, the some slides on the fatigue and masonry. So first starting with the modeling capabilities in uh, the computational structure mechanics group. So in our high fidelity models are based on a mesoscale representation where we have a distinction between uh, the masonry units and the mortar joints. Each is uh, modeled separately. Most of the, yeah, the, the nonlinearity, uh, the material nonlinearity is lumped within the nonlinear interface elements while we're using elastic solid elements for the bricks. To model this nonlinearity, a plastic uh, damage formulation is uh, developed. And this, as you can see, the, this uh, plastic damage formulation has a dedicated yield function for each plastic surface. This model is also capable of capturing the cyclic behavior. And uh, yeah, all of these developments are implemented using uh, inside Adaptic software, which is a nonlinear finite element uh, program developed here at Imperial. And to provide more capability dealing with the masonry arch bridges, a parametric modeling tool is uh, developed to allow modeling the different components of the masonry arch bridges, allowing the interaction between them. This tool allows modeling different bond uh, patterns parametrically, and to deal with such large models, uh, domain partitioning techniques has been developed in order to improve the computational efficiency through parallel computation. Okay, going to the material parameters. It's always tricky when dealing with finite element models, how to calibrate the model. So first, these models contains a lot of parameters that needs to be calibrated. Some of these parameters are directly related to parameters that can be extracted from experimental uh, material tests, and some are indirectly related. Some of, uh, uh, yeah, so the, we can just, uh, uh, during the material test, we can test the units, we can test the masonry assemblages, and th this can be, these are direct parameters that can be tested. And But when modeling the mortar joints, for example, you need to derive the stiffness for these parameters. So we define or derive the stiffness based on both the youngest models for the units and the youngest models for masonry assemblages. 
Other parameters, uh, which are mostly nonlinear, these parameters can, can be difficult to be estimated within uh, material tests. So ba based on literature, we used a different, uh, some range of uh, values for defining the parameters or some relations by relating these parameters to the direct parameters obtained from the material tests. OK, so going to the validation for our numerical model. So again, it's uh, an extensive uh, validation where we considered three validation examples, two from previous uh, projects and one from the current project, which is a test car uh, carried out at Leeds presented earlier today. So the first one is uh, a validation for a square bridge, which is uh, a square bridge tested at Bolton. It's a three meters band bridge, uh, composed of two rings using stretcher bond, and uh, it has a rise to span ratio one to four, which is the typical uh, most common uh, rise to span ratio. As you can see, this is an experimental setup, and this is how we model this using our tools. And uh, looking at the load displacement curve, the comparing the experimental and the numerical curves, we managed to accurately predict the load displacement response. Not only that, we managed to predict accurately the failure mode compared to the experimental response, capturing different cracks within the spandrel wall and also capturing the separation at different locations between the arch barrel and the spandrel wall, as you can see. Looking more on uh, into the arch barrel, we can see that in the experiment there is a typical four hinge mechanism in uh, the arch barrel, and the model we can see from the 3D deformity for the model that this was uh, captured accurately using our numerical model, and also what we managed to find uh, using our numerical model is the ring separation below the load, which is actually can be seen here clearly from the experimental investigation. Moving to our second validation example, which is uh, on a skew bridge, which is a skew bridge tested by Hodgson. The geometry is somehow similar, having the same span. Uh, the width of the bridge is all, almost the same, but the, this width is along the width along the abutment, leaving the perpendicular width from face to face almost 2.5 meter. And again, the same rise to span ratio, and uh, it is constructed using the helicoidal construction method for the skew arch bridges, and the skew angle is 45 degree. Again, we modeled this using our uh, tools, and we found a good agreement between the load displacement curves, managing to capture almost a uh, close uh, failure load. Looking at the fail is experimental failure mode, we notice that we have um, a so tools shaped failure mode where this is can be related to uh, the helicoidal construction method, uh, making the bond causing these uh, sutos shaped cracks. The numerical model managed to capture the main cracks within uh, the experimental investigation, capturing the main cracks on the intradose of the R. Looking at the failure mode in the spandrel wall, which was very complex in the case of uh, the experimental investigation. However, the numerical model managed to capture the main features on the east elevation as well as the west elevation. As can seen in by uh, the different cracks. Going to the last part of uh, my part in the presentation. So after that, we used these um, two validation examples and they used the same geometry for them in order to investigate the 3D 
behavior for both square and skew masonry arch bridges. So if we can see here, uh, we try to apply batch loads to trigger uh, the 3D response compared to the line load applied in the two validation examples. So we, for, for the case of the square bridge, we uh, applied the load at four locations uh, across the quarter span, mid span, and quarter width and mid width. And for the case of this Q bridge, we added two cases at three quarter uh, widths. Okay. Yeah, we have something missing here. Yeah, but uh, okay, I'll, I can use uh, what is appearing for you. Okay, so yeah, looking at the pillar modes for the different patch loads. So for the top figures, the load is uh, applied at the mid width at both mid span and quarter span. What we can notice here that we have a mixed uh, or a combination of two modes. It's a 2D mode, can, which can be clearly seen you through the crack going through the whole width of the bridge, which can be seen in both at both mid span and the quarter span. But this crack is accompanied with diagonal cracks radiating out of this 2D crack indicating the 3D behavior under patch load in the case of the square bridge. Moving to the case of the eccentric loading at the two uh, bottom figures, we can see that the behavior, just when we started to apply the load eccentrically, the, lo the behavior totally changed into 3D. There, there is no 2D response anymore. This can be indicated by the diagonal cracks as well as the cracks not going through the whole width of the bridge. Moving to the skew bridges, again, the load applied at mid span first. And what we can notice when the load was uh, applied, so again, the load is applied at mid span at mid width, quarter width, three quarter width. And when the load is applied at the mid span, due to the asymmetry of the uh, of this skew bridges, we can notice some twisting between the two halves of the bridge. This can be clearly seen in this case for the load applied at the mid width, and again, it's it can be noticed at the two other cases, which can be attributed to, as I highlighted earlier, the small width, the small perpendicular width for the bridge which is causing the cracks to continue through the whole width of the R. Looking at quarter span, again, a different location of uh, the width. Again, we are noticing the pseudo-shaped cracks going through the whole width, but some uh, additional features are clearly seen in uh, the behavior. First, we can see the that there is sliding ring and ring separation in case or in all of the cases, and this was also considered. Uh, this was also noticed at when the load is applied at the mid span. And also, what we can notice here, if I use the pointer, is that yeah, what we can notice here is that the arch pattern starts to divide into several blocks. In the different cases, it can be clearly seen here, where and there is a relative shearing between these rigid blocks. This feature is more pronounced here when we applied the load at the quarter span. Okay, uh, passing uh, the mic to my colleague to talk about the data feeds. Thank you. So we'll now cover the final validation test and with leads. So we'll try to answer the question, have you matched the results? I will demystify, we did. So let's look at what we got. So this is our detailed models that we constructed for the leads test. I will not go over the dimensions of the model because it was covered by Vasilis quite extensively. So some of the material properties we used based on the results from uh, leads test and we constructed a second model, which you see is far more coarse compared to the more detailed one. 
uh, we did this to investigate uh, effects because this model is far smaller. So you can also see it's about 10 times smaller compared to the original one, which has a substantial reduction in running time. So if the, for the previous model running time was in days, this is hours. So as I said, we match the ultimate capacity quite well, but you might notice some discrepancies here, right? So our initial stiffness seems to be not matching the ultimate test. So remember this, in particular remember that we do not really match at all with the uh, initial stiffness for the central point. And also keep in mind that this is the ultimate test that was conducted after a numer numerous tests on the bridge before, where it was loaded at numerous positions, both in three quarter at mid and one quarter span. So we will investigate this in a further test to show that this is actually a correct behavior. Uh, so let's go through the damages and we'll go through them very briefly because they're matching what was already observed for the uh, square arch test. So we matched uh, the damages in the spandrel wall uh, as well as the damage in the abutment area where we have uh, diagonal cracks crossing it. We captured the initial 2D response with also some of initiation of 3D effects in the arch barrel. So this is how the damage yeah develops in both uh, detailed and reduced model over time. So you see you have initially formation of a 2D, 2D mechanism that is then uh, complemented by 3D effects under the patch loading and on the opposite side of the bridge. Uh, so now let's come to again to the point where we said that we don't match the initial slope. And as I said before, the tests were conducted in, in multiple series. So first you had lower lo lo loading, then you had higher loading and all different positions. So to investigate this, we considered uh, positioning of the test patch and we started applying loads first at lower levels and then unloading, then loading again at higher levels and so on until we get to failure. And what would you expect? We start matching the initial slope. So here is the culprit of initial discrepancies. You can also see the changes in the initials on the stiffness of the model if we plot this uh, each cycle separately, and you can clearly see that with each subsequent cycle, the stiffness decreases. But if we now look at the first cycles, where we compare against the experimental results from the very low loading level, we see that we not only match the stiffness slopes, but we also match the direction for the central point, which was different before. So this is just characterized by the fact that initially the central point is moving together with the load, but then it just when the failure mode forms, it changes the direction. And uh, now going over the damages that were less ca captured less accurately on previous tests, we see a more clearly def delineation of 3D effects in the arch barrel, as well as formation of multiple cracks in the barrel on the side here, for both two cracks in the, under the load, as well as further torsional cracks at the edges. And as well, we also get a double line of cracks on the abutment. Uh, as for the compressive cr uh, crack over here, we see that the crack opens on the arch extradus, which corresponds to the crushing of mortar described by Vasilis as well. And this is the progression of the uh, damage. What's interesting here is that uh, while the crack, initial formation of crack required high level of loading, but as each subsequent cycle, the crack starts opening at substantially lower level of loading compared to when it formed initially. And now we will uh, complete uh, this with a very brief introduction of uh, introduction of our preliminary results on fatigue. Uh, so, uh, if in masonry structures, uh, it's quite important to understand how long the bridge can sustain the load, continuous cyclic load, as it uh, starts deform, joints deteriorate, and prop, uh, Assets owners wants to know how long can they run it. So we started some investigation and existing literature indicates that we, we can observe some change in failure mode and some overall deterioration of, of, of structural strengths. To this end, the uh, model was developed by one of my colleagues, uh, uh, which includes effects of uh, fatigue damage into our model described by Mohammed earlier. And using this model, we conducted a uh, test based on existing experimental uh, uh, data where uh, a, a masonry arch consisting of two rings was uh, investigated under cyclic loading. So initially we validated our model against the static test where we match very, very well. 
And then we move on to the cyclic test. In the cyclic test, the arch was initially preloaded by 10 kN at one quarter and three quarter span, which was then added the cyclic loading. And you see the red and blue arrows uh, in contra effect with 14 kN until failure. And as you can see, we matched failure point very well. I was even myself surprised how well we matched there, considering the cyclic loading, there are a lot of parameters here involved. Uh, so we estimated it to fail at uh, 23,900 cycles, while the test set 23,000 cycles, which is effectively the same point. Uh, how the damage was formed? So this is the final uh, deformed state, as we observed in our numerical model, and formations initiated with cracks forming at uh, quarter and three quarter span under the load. Then it progressed to cracks forming at the supports, and eventually we saw a shearing between two rings resulting at a, uh, almost at a failure point of the arch. Uh, we conducted some parametric studies on the effect of different parameters. We investigated our numerical parameters first, which affect how many cycles the system can contain. And this was the point of some of the tests we were conducting at least to try to calibrate this model to a uh, related to actual parameters that can be ex extracted from actual masonry, uh, where this parameter indicates, for instance, effect of uh, uh, limit at which fatigue starts to play effect. We also investigated effect of uh, loading itself, so we considered effect of uh, changing the level of preloadings from uh, uh, 10 to 20 kilonewtons to almost to the peak loading, and we also considered changing the live loading from low, both lower to higher ends. And the results here are as expected, with some interesting effects, specifically uh, in terms of shapes of the functions. Uh, we also looked into the effect of material parameters, where we can clearly see that uh, uh, one last slide. Uh, first friction angle uh, affects uh, very clearly the result. Well, tensile strength uh, causes massive effect at the lower end, but we move from effectively no strength mortar to some strength mortar, but the effect reduces as we move to higher strength mortars. So now coming to conclusion, so as I hope as I can manage to impress you that uh, we our models capturing the results quite well. We are very accurate in predicting both ultimate load and failures response. We show some promise in our cyclic behavior and effects, and results on fatigue indicates that it's a very promising aspect that requires further investigation and application to larger breaches. So thank you for your time, and if you have any questions. Questions for the speaker? Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, you showed some slides. Uh, I think it was probably the adaptic model uh, where you were showing deformations of the intrados under load and it showed the square span. Did you have the same information for the skew span? Uh, and did it show any sort of trends in the obtuse and acute corners? Which part of the presentation was it? I think it was the initial part of the presentation. Yeah. About, uh, yeah, so the skew span and whether there are any sort of, um, well, any information you can pull from the obtuse and acute corners on the intrados. Uh, you mean, yeah, we're not so blind the batch loads. Yeah, you, you've got the models there, yeah. And, and were, were there any sort of, is there any sort of information, any trends on the obtuse and acute corners? On uh, usually what we noticed is that the obtuse uh, corners provide a stiffer response compared to uh, the accurate ones. Yeah. And this somehow uh, agrees with what is found in literature uh, and by uh, the, 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 the white experiments uh, yeah, done by Hodgson. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this is what we found about uh, okay, the functions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. There's a question here. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Sinan Chikas, University of Oxford. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, two questions. One of them is uh, is about the uh, um, is about what a crack is in this model uh, with respect to the constitutive parameters, where it comes from. I don't understand that. And the second thing is um, uh, with the fatigue parameters. I was wondering if they are uh, measurable quantities. So you know, what was the idea with uh, if if they can be gathered from from a test, and what your ideas on that are? Yes. So, uh, what crack is in our model? 
so in our model, as was discussed yesterday, it consists of uh, two elements. So it consists first of uh, solid blocks connected together with nonlinear interfaces. Those nonlinear interfaces, they can have a deformation against each other. So crack is basically an opening of this interface. So when I have a deformation forming there, when you reach the effectively the limit of strength of this particular uh, interface is in shear of tensile strength or any other form or com combination of those two. Uh, as for but parameters for fatigue, yes, I rushed through that part. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, so we can see uh, so fatigue model is based on existing uh, existing models in the literature with some slight modifications. Uh, so the model consists it contains uh, three parameters. So it's um, uh, parameter alpha over here. It's uh, it scales damage uh, sort of in a linear fashion. Parameter beta it scales damage in this exponential expression, and parameter eta that scales at what level of stress our damage starts to occur due to fatigue. Uh, then miss something from your question. Yeah, and how the efficient uh, getting these parameters from a test? Uh, so from so small experience that we had with testing in with the results from leads. So what we observe in the test that when we have a cyclic test, we first uh, get a gradual growth of damage if we get in correct ranges, of course, and then we have a rapid growth. And then it, we have again a slow growth or failure at this point. So if we can uh, get those results consistently from the test, then we can calibrate our model because, uh, for instance, alpha controls when you will have the first point of your um, response. So if I go to this curve, I think. So you see here, we have initially we have a slight growth, then we have rapid point. And then we have uh, basically a final stretch of growth before it fails. fails. So if we can capture the same point in our tests, we can calibrate our models. Uh, so alpha controls where the first point ex happens, beta controls the drop up, and then eta controls at what level of uh, load in it will occur. So just doing this uh, few tests here with different levels of loading, we can calibrate this. Again, this is still a point of research. This is our assumptions. We validate it partially, but not yet fully. So it's still a work in progress. Thank you. I mean, just, just to clarify that, um, Vasilis didn't have time in his presentation to talk about anything more than the bridge, but it, a whole series, sequence of uh, material characterization tests have been carried out at Leeds, which could easily be the subject of another half hour presentation, but we haven't uh, had time. OK, I think we're, we're out of time, so I'm afraid we're going to have to to um, thank the, the speakers for their uh, presentation and move on to the next uh, talk. OK, excellent. So, yeah, Thanks. I should just introduce you. Uh, the second speaker, sorry, in this session is uh, Sinan. How do you, how do you I should it? I should go. OK, that. <laughs> uh, who's going to talk to us about, um, about, well, original title will include some monitoring, but it's, it's, it's like it's now focusing primarily on damage detection. So take it away. That's right. Um, so I'm going to talk about detecting damage in masonry ash railway bridges. And interestingly, for a talk like this, it's not going to involve much field data, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Um, but uh, we've seen uh, a lot of this context. So very briefly, a significant amount of masonry railway bridges exist in the UK, most of them from the 19th century, where the lows are very different. Uh, today, the lows tend to be generally higher, with carriages uh, generally longer, speeds uh, uh, as well uh, significantly higher. So the result of this is that every time uh, when you go to a bridge, you see cracking, spalling and loose material. Um, reasons for damage, there are many. Um, there is a very nice paper from early 2000s by Zoltan Orban, where he listed five categories of damage. If we start from the bottom up, uh, peer abutment foundation problems are common. Uh, you will get, we, will, we often get settlements, um, which might happen due to ground related issues, or it might happen due to loads. Here's an example. Uh, this might recall uh, Brian Dugo's presentation yesterday. This is a uh, relieving arch and a crack above it. Um, um, as, uh, as, as there were similar photographs uh, yesterday, so this is a typical type of damage that happens under load. Scour, we've seen many nice examples in, uh, in Rico's presentation. Uh, more commonly, when you go to bridges, you see this sort of thing on, 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 on spandrels. Um, spandrels involve uh, uh, quite a lot of different types of uh, damage. You get this sort of separation at the backing level, you get separation at, uh, at parapet level, and you get separation between the arch and the um, and the spandrel as well, and this generally is due to live uh, live loading. Um, 
a lot of these things are often accompanied by huge amounts of material degradation, um, mostly due to water in ingress, uh, efflorescence, staining are very commonly observed, and spalling of brick materials uh, often is commonly observed. And uh, you can see quite a lot of replaced bricks in that slide. So how do we deal with all of this damage? We do periodic visual uh, and tactile on-site inspections. Here's a photograph I found on the internet on that. And uh, bridge owners have been exploring how this could be improved, um, and uh, especially techno uh, technology using laser scanning and photogrammetry. And here's a photograph from uh, Bill Harvey Associates um, of a photogrammetry point cloud, and we've seen some in Vasilis' presentation earlier. So this sort of stuff can really help improve um, uh, how we go out to site and how we see things on site. Um, only when we need more information do we go to monitoring, and that's to understand the impact of damage on bridge response generally, just to gain further understanding and see if it's significant. And a typical way to do this is using deflection poles. Uh, we've explored some different techniques based on fiber optic sensing and, 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 and digital image correlation, but I won't be talking about those. That's from already a few years ago, so I decided not to talk about that today. But I've talk, I'll talk about something else, which is um, which is more about damage detection in the field. And there is very interesting research that's going on in this, in, in this field. And this is, um, this is a plot from one of Assis's papers um, where um, machine learning techniques are being used to identify and classify defects. Um, you've, got a, you've got a photograph with, with a defect. Um, generally, to be able to use this sort of algorithm, you need to have true labels. So somebody needs to have gone to, um, to, a, to, a, to a photograph, generally thousands of photographs labeled, here's a crack, here's a crack, here's an uncrack. And the algorithm learns about this, and then it could give predictions. And these can be quite powerful. In recent years, they've gotten to a good state. But still, bridges are quite difficult uh, to work with. They're not clean surfaces. Um, the data we have is often not enough. There's very limited data. Um, and uh, there, there, there are many things that about these, especially about cracks and the, the way they look under light, that is very difficult to spot. So it's very influenced by light conditions. And mortar joints often look like cracks. So th these algorithms are, are very promising, but they have not been established yet for, um, for, for field use just yet. Um, so uh, the other problem that I think is, is, is the one that I'd like to focus on is that a lot of the damage actually when you go to a bridge is hidden from sight. And when I say hidden, I mean, you can notice that there is damage, but sometimes you cannot notice that there is a crack. So what's, you know, how do we use that information? How do we use those algorithms when you cannot see a crack? You, your bricks may be replaced, so that removes the spalling away, so we cannot use that information. There might be repointing on the bridge, like you see over there. So again, you know, mortar loss information is lost. There might be a render over the surface, which gets rid of all the visual information again. So th these, these things are difficult to spot. Damage may be hidden. Very typically, if you've got this sort of hinging type mechanism, you've got all these damage at the extrados area. Again, you know, th these are not possible to spot at the moment. And the other final point I want to make here in this slide is that the surfaces of bricks might look good uh, because they've been recently cleaned, but that doesn't mean that there is no degradation in there either. So, you know, we don't know how bridges have been influenced, materials have been influenced. And these are the sort of things that, that, uh, that, that, really uh, interested me. And uh, and this is a case study uh, we did a few years ago. Um, and one of the authors, I've just found out, Ewan Riley is in the audi audience of this uh, 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 in today, today for, for this case study. And uh, what we were looking at here was the question of how can we detect this hidden damage? Uh, is there a way? And it, we more happened upon it. I mean, that wasn't the question at the time, but we more ha it ha it, we happened upon this data that when we scanned this bridge and started to look at the distortions inside these point clouds. So here you see all these green points, which are the actual point clouds, and here's a fitted surface to the bridge. We noticed that there are very distinctive patterns, like in sharp kinks inside this data. And that's very interesting because things were uh, changing very quickly around specific points. And that to us indicated that there are, uh, these are locations of potentially extra dose cracks and intra dose cracks. And we corroborated that with some other signs of damage that you see in these bridges. There were non-horizontal joints, um, like you see a sagging spring, springing line here. So there were bits of information which told us that actually the geometry has uh, the key bit of information that we need. We don't necessarily need to go to the visuals to understand things. Um, and it's this geometry aspect that, that I'm going to talk about more, more about today. 
And it can, uh, but the algorithms that we used at the time were really case specific. We were fitting geometries, fiddling around, trying to understand patterns. Um, so we, it got me thinking, how can we generalize this? The second aspect of hidden damage, and I'll talk about it very briefly today, is, as I said, about materials. We just don't know what's the current status of materials. We mentioned today material degradation, material degradation, but, you know, ha have the materials degraded significantly? And the, I mean, the, the, the most reliable way to do this is to test materials, but testing materials of bridges is quite difficult. Um, we, uh, you know, we can get samples of mortar, we can get cord samples, but these often provide insufficient data. From a core sample, you just get masonry strength. You don't know what the individual components are and their status is. In situ testing, using flat track testing is quite, an, uh, quite a good idea and uh, sometimes employed. Um, and there was a very nice uh, paper um, a number of years ago from uh, Lorenzo's group in Imperial College where they used all the um, all the data from a flat track test to uh, update finite element models to find parameters of those finite element models to identify what's the elasticity modulus, what's the fracture energy, all those difficult parameters. Um, but this requires thousands of analyses, so it, it, it takes quite a lot of time to, to be able to do that. And what we've been exploring in the last few years, and I, I think this has got potentially future for a potential future for, for bridge monitoring um, uh, projects, is to identify materials in situ using a technique called virtual fields method. And the really wonderful thing about this technique is that it just uses strains that you measure on the field, on the surface, generally using cameras, and converts that using the equilibrium equations into a set of parameters by using a series of optimization and linear uh, inversions. So this, this is something that, that I'm excited about. But unfortunately, because I wasn't invited to talk about that, I won't talk about that. I mean, at least that's how much I'll talk about it. So uh, that's something else. Um, what I'll talk about is the first aspect, the question of geometric crack detection. So the question that we asked, us, uh, asked ourselves was, can we use geometric distortions to enable robust crack detection? And um, this, is, this is potentially more robust because we're talking about light and surface treatment independent cracks. And it's more focused not on local defects, but on pathologies, structural pathologies. And as I said, I, what I'm going to be presenting is more research ideas. So uh, I don't think this is ready to go out to the field yet, but we first started thinking, how can we do this? Well, laser scanning is commonly used to generate 3D point cloud models in the industry. Um, there are in fact, uh, for, for, for many bridges now, models like this that Network Rail has. Um, the question that's that, that, that we wanted to inquire was, can we use the data to train a machine learning model to detect cracks? Of course, machine learning models can detect cracks if you teach them where the cracks are. It's not obvious where the cracks are when you look at point clouds. Uh, you cannot visibly see them. Um, and nobody's going to go label millions of points and say this is cracked, this is uncracked. So we have this issue that we just don't have labels and we just cannot train uh, point clouds. And the data volume, although, as I said, there are probably point clouds, it's not going to be enough because th these methods are very data hungry. So we started asking the question, OK, can we now generate the data synthetically? Because we had some success uh, with synthetic ge data generation in previous studies where uh, we wanted to, where we had a point cloud and we wanted to segment this into components, saying this is arch, this is peer, uh, this is spandrel, which is a reasonably simple task for a human to do, but for a machine to do is complex. Um, uh, because these geometries vary quite a lot. What we did in that case is we didn't have enough data, so we generated a synthetic data set, uh, which was just done using mathematical functions. And those synthetic data sets were then used to train the network. And the real data set uh, uh, was uh, then tested. We had some point clouds that we used for tests, and we could get good results. So the question was, can we simulate cracking in the fields and laser scan data collection in, in, in the computer environment, in a 3D environment, in a, in a modeling environment, and use this information to develop monitoring tools that could be used then later in the field. And we've gone into this, this cycle of development, and this is, this is what, I, uh, what, what we're basically doing. We've seen today, and I think yesterday too, that numerical models are very powerful now to detect cracks. So uh, I think they are good representations of reality. So we started with these numerical mechanical simulators where you have a model which includes all those components and you can run this model and you can get um, 
we're using. I'll talk about the constitutive models we're using, but it gives us some crack with outputs. Once we've got that, then we need to simulate point clouds, the data collection of putting a laser scanner on the ground and then, uh, and then scanning it. And that's what we have here, the point cloud simulator. And the great thing is, because we know the cracks from the model, we can now have all these points automatically labeled. And that's really the reason why the synthetic data is extremely powerful. We can now say all of these points are actually, uh, are actually cracks. And the final bit of our, um, of our work, uh, which definitely needs improvements, but I'll show you some initial results today, is the geometric crack detection side of things. So just using this geometric information, there is no color here. Just using geometry, can we detect cracks? And, and I'll talk about that um, in a few minutes. I'll talk about these individual components. Starting with mechanical simulator, we're considering single span bridges because they're the majority of the stock. We've got different components, as you can see. We're dealing with homogenized bodies. Uh, the reason for that is that it's, it's easy to mesh and computationally efficient, although there is no reason why we wouldn't use micro scale models or more uh, advanced models uh, if we wanted to. We're, we have masonry elements, soil elements, interfaces between these different components as well. That's all built into the model. The geometry is completely parametrically defined, which means that all these characteristics that you see here have been defined using previous studies uh, from literature. I've cited them here. Material properties also completely randomly defined, and the model generation is completely automatic uh, using Python scripting in Diana. So all of these models can be done at the click of a button um, to generate within uh, the parameter ranges. What are the loads that we're subjecting the model to? Uh, well, we had to choose something, and we decided that foundation movements uh, would be an easy one to, to start with. So we started with that. So we're um, looking at, um, at translations uh, along the bridge longitudinal settlements in one of the piers or rotation in one of the piers. And we're combining all of these into random combinations so that we could uh, get different types of damage. So we're trying to create that data that has a lot of different types of damage so that the models can learn how it all behaves. Now, that's, I guess, the more established parts, easy parts. Mechanical simulators, they work. This is the part that we civil engineers are less familiar with. 3D modeling environments, you can do fantastic stuff. And actually, this is something that, that the self-driving uh, autonomous cars fields uses quite a lot. You can generate cityscapes. You can generate some wonderful environments. You can generate uh, scanning data as well. And uh, this scanning data is, is quite powerful because it can capture noise, which is an important component of what we're trying to do. So not all the points are on the surface here, as you can see. So there's noise in the data. It can capture occlusions. So when you're scanning on the other side of the bridge, you don't see anything on this side, which is, again, very important. It can capture varying point density. So as you move away from the scanner, you see how the circles are moving away from each other. So it captures all these things. Uh, which are quite important to generate realistic point clouds. And then we label those point clouds. And the way we label them is we take the finite element uh, output of crack widths, and every point that uh, touches that surface, which is cracked from the finite element geometry, gets labeled with a crack output on the point cloud, which is shown with blue and red here. So this is how the point cloud simulators work. We with this technique, we could run 200 bridge models uh, that were generated and analyzed automatically. And it gave us quite a lot of data at different loading stages of these bridges as well. And we've got uh, many different images of, of the damages like this. So this is a typical type of damage, which I wanted to show, which is the piers, uh, the piers moving away from each other. And it generates the crack that you expect at the, um, uh, at the crown, as well as the cracks that you expect at the, um, at the spandrels. Now, this is the crux of the talk, I guess. The uh, important thing is, so we've got this data now, and you know, that's a very interesting data, but what is it useful for? Um, is, is, it, is it going to work, especially for this idea of uh, detecting cracks? So as you can see, we've got just point clouds, no information about texture. Um, can we use this inform uh, Can you use the point clouds to, to detect cracks? We use a technique called patch core, uh, which is used to uh, investigate chips in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in factory lines. Um, uh, it's an unsupervised learning technique. It's an anomaly detection type technique. So the way it works is at the first stage, the algorithm will learn what is a normal point cloud. So it will create a memory bank of features. From those features, then we will investigate the next point cloud, which is 
in this case, cracked point clouds. And we will then see if those features in the geometry are unusual, if it's something that that uh, that the point cloud hasn't encountered before. Um, and uh, it's based on an abnormality score S, which I've uh, uh, specified here. So I talked about geometric features. What does geometric feature mean? What, what does a geometric feature imply? It's an entirely geometric concept. Um, this is uh, a tech, we used a vector, feature vector called something called that's fast point feature histogram. Um, it's basically a technique that uh, can generate um, uh, that can generate normal and geodesic curvature indicators. So um, it, it's a bit difficult to, to 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 explain, but basically it looks at how normals change across a point cloud, and it uses this information, normals and various other vectors. Um, uh, change and it uses this information to come up with a, a distribution that is indicative of normal and geodesic curvature and geodesic torsion. Um, this is just just a way to say when you've got a crack, generally curvature changes around that crack. So we're trying to really pick that aspect up. And um, I'll show you how how it works in an example case. So here is the finite element model that we had. We're settling the pier. Um, by about eight centimeters in this case, and the finite element result tells us on the arch that you're, we're supposed to get, you know, an, uh, an inch of those crack here, an extra of those crack here at these locations, um, you know, different magnitudes, and on the spandle we're supposed to get these cracks. These are the point clouds that have been generated um, from from those stages, and we apply this idea of the patch core onto those point, point clouds. And what we saw, if we start with the arch is that depending on this threshold, abnormality threshold, if we use a lower threshold, we were able to see both the um, intradose crack and extradose crack. And I think this results really I'm very happy with because we should, if, it, if we were looking just underneath the bridge, we probably wouldn't be seeing anything about the extradose crack, but it's inside the geometry. So that, that was very encouraging to see that. But of course you see, it, it, it's not a perfect match as yet. So we, we, there, there's things we need to work on, but it is in the geometry and it can be picked up is the key thing. And the second thing that we've looked at was the spandrel. And here there's a massive failure. Spandrel cracks are not detected at all. Not at all. And we tried to understand why for a little while. And then it became obvious that we were trying to detect something that has no influence on the features of the point cloud. So if you've got an undeformed object, that's a rectangle, you deform it, you shear it, and you deform it into this parallelogram, you don't change its curvatures. So the problem was due to the fact that we were looking at curvatures, which refer to generally out of plane uh, type changes. And what we needed to do was to look at different features. But then we started adding sort of these, these geometric textures on the surface, referring to the masonry patterns. And you can really clearly see that the horizontality of the bed joints are changing. The, the information is there, uh, but our feature vectors are not picking it up. So we're going to change our feature vector um, next and so that it can have some positional encoding so it can understand the, the relationships between sort of joints normally being horizontal and changing after after cracking. So this is uh, kind of what we're doing next. So I know that that's, that's, uh, that, that, that's just the start of the path, uh, but I think there is potential in this idea of geometric crack detection. And there's big potential, I think, in the idea that we can actually now, with these good simulators, um, capture cracking behavior and use that to generate data, which can be really powerful, I think. So we leverage the simulation to be able to understand something about real uh, structures. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's a really viable path for the future. Um, I talked about how patch core is, is, is problematic at the moment and how we're improving the feature vectors. and um, and. As I've just said uh, again, the, the, it, it's quite important that, uh, that to overcome this data scarcity, we can use this idea of, of, uh, of, damage, uh, of using these simulators, and they can give us new capabilities that we didn't have. So we, we, we normally cannot detect these hidden cracks very easily. Um, so this can, they can give us new capabilities, which I think will be amazing. Um, just very brief, uh, two, uh, one or two slides to, to finish off. Um, what are the sort of other things you can do with with images uh, or with point clouds? Um, you can evaluate material quality, um, and this is just done through. This is an auto mosaic of a bridge uh, that I've seen actually recently in Turkey um, after the earthquakes. Um, 
if you've got these sort of orthophoto bridges, you can find out what are the so sizes of stones, how circular they are. And this sort of information can tell you what's, what, how, what's the state of your bridge, how good is your construction quality. And that sort of information also can be really useful to be able to say something about uh, you know, the types of bridges which tend to get damaged. Um, this is something that, again, I'm not going to talk about more than this slide, but the uh, I, when I talk to bridge engineers, what I find out is that they're much more interested in new cracks forming and old cracks propagating. So otherwise, bridges are taught to be safe if there are no new cracks and you know if, if, if the old cracks are not propagating. So instead of detecting cracks, the quest, uh, suggestion was, can we just do long-term non-contact monitoring of these of these structures, and that we we think we can do with point cloud monitoring. Um, I uh, this is, these are some tests that we've done recently on on some settling buildings in uh, uh, in in Turkey, and because masonry has got all these wonderful patterns on it, it's got a lot of ways to match different point clouds, uh, so it can really match geometric features on point clouds quite well, and you can actually get indications of displacements and strains in 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 these point clouds. So I think if if, if the idea develops well enough, this, this is the sort of thing that can be really powerful because you can go and scan bridges from time to time every year and find out if your cracks are growing or you know, if, if displacements are, uh, are, are there or not. And it's important that the displacements have full field. So you get everything visible, you get a point and you get a measurement. Um, and I don't want to oversell this again because there are challenges, but th this is the idea that, 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 that we're pursuing. Um, final thing, monitoring is quite important. Uh, it gives you additional data, and in the lab we can do wonderful things with monitoring. We've seen some examples of digital image correlation being used. We use it quite a lot with material tests, where you can see strains, strain concentrations, cracks happening before they, they occur. But translating this to the field is quite difficult at the moment, so I guess this is a point for discussion later, where you know, we need to develop techniques which can do this um, uh, in, in three dimensions in the fields, uh, because uh, we need three-dimensional measurement techniques in the field, and these techniques just cannot be translated due to the way they work directly into the field at the moment. Um, acknowledgements for my colleagues who have been involved in this work. Thank you. Opportunity for uh, some questions for the speaker. Let's use this one first. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, can you uh, uh, clarify for me? So as I understood, you're using smear damage model in your problem, but wouldn't you, basically this create a more complex problem for you? Because as, as it's being smeared, your damage is effectively just a very change effectively in this use. So saying uh, it still continue, stays continuous in your numerical model, yeah. while in reality it would, you would see the discontinuity of a crack. Because you sort of create an extra problem for ourselves. Uh, absolutely. So if we were working with discrete models, I think our life would be easier. Uh, but the computational uh, situation prevented us from doing that. Um, so we, we were doing this on just desktop computers, uh, which are running to generate these models. So this is why we've used smear cracks. The cracks are less sharp, which means that when we calculate features over geometries, we calculate them over bigger spaces because the cracks are being spread across distances. So we, we, we do have an issue with regards to that, but we think that's not an issue of methodology, it's an issue of technique that you know, could be improved. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, because you were just modeling those foundation settlement caused cracks, whether that would limit the applicability of it into the field at the moment. So whether your model would only pick up those cracks when looking in the field. Um, well, I guess the, we, we could uh, generalize the procedure to include different types of loads, but what we're picking up is entirely geometric. So it's just picking up the, the fact that around the crack, you've got a sharp change of geometries. Normals are changing very quickly of surfaces, and that will happen whether we're dealing with a vertical load that's being applied from, from, from above or from, from, from the foundations. So I think the uh, sort of, I, I don't think the crack uh, pattern is going to change. We did this because it was easier to define parameters related to sort of how foundations move um, in, in a reasonable way. I had more experience with that. So that's why we, we went for that. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Maybe thought about um, using colored point clouds, not 
using just laser scanning, combining photogrammetry with the point clouds, that you have more information than just the geometry. That's indeed the case, and I think we might need to do that. Um, I find that color is a bit of a false friend. Uh, it, it, sometimes you look at it and you, you see a crack, another day you don't see a crack. Um, and color changes quite a lot. Uh, the, the, the fact that a lot because of light changes, color changes, whereas geometry is much more immutable. It stays as it is. So we wanted to explore this idea, which was newer uh, of using geometry. But absolutely, you're right that it can help some of these algorithms uh, to actually detect things as well. So I think that's something that we the might be doing. Right. The point is, I tried it with a student just to with geometry and yeah. just with color coding, and we had connected both together. The results were way better than just having it. But we did it on a 2D plane, so yeah. it's not a 3D. Masonry art bridges. It was just a plane. Yeah, yeah. But uh, thank you for the suggestion. I think that's a good that's a good idea that we wish to explore as well. Okay, just time for one more question. Raise one. Yeah. Fine. So uh, looking at uh, some experimental results uh, shown earlier, uh, under an application, let's say of a heavy load, and not 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 from you actually, from okay. from under. Um, you see that uh, you can reach the peak load, and then when you load. Uh, there is a significant, uh, uh, very little residual deformations. And uh, so that's, uh, I mean, I, I wonder how much distortion is left when you have subjected the bridge to a very significant loading, yeah. but then you have, the, the, say, you do the passage of a heavy vehicle that yeah. and then has disappeared. And that's that a very, very good point. Permanent deformations yeah. are not very significant. Um, that's a very good point. My answer to that is this is one of the reasons, and I thank you for bringing this up. This is one of the reasons why we're working on foundations. I think when you look at this this list, you know, rank one to, you know, goes on to 15 or something in Zoltan Orban's paper, overloading of arches is one of the least concerned uh, in, in, in this list. And I do think in the field that we, we don't generally see overloading of arches. What we tend to see, I think, is, is uh, you know, damage, damage, residual damage that's being formed. Uh, that's, in my experience, I've seen a lot of foundation cases, which is why I focused on this and this corroborated that. Um, Spandle cracks, we see them very often and they don't close because they're a sort of stiffness related thing and they, they propagate over time. So I thought we could pick those things up. But I guess if you are thinking about these sort of really uh, big failure loads when you get towards the end, I think we might not be quite successful in picking those up. OK, thank you very much uh, Thanks. to the speaker. Um, Now, moving on to the, the final presentation in this session. It will be delivered by uh, um, setting Professor Ivo Kalia, who uh, wins the award for traveling the furthest uh, uh, to be with us with the uh, from the south of Italy. So uh, um, please uh, take it away. started this with two students. Thank you, uh, Matthew. One of them is third year now. So mm -hmm. yeah, work that we've been doing. And the top students. First of all, uh, I have to thank uh, all the group of the Airbnb project for inviting me to present this uh, this presentation. And uh, my presentation is uh, on the tentative to introduce, uh, not to simplify model for modeling a Mesory bridge a model that can be used in uh, practical engineering. So as we saw in the previous presentation, detailing modeling of Mesory using high fidelity model, it's uh, a very good tool for modeling uh, the behavior of Mesory bridges, but it's uh, hardly to be to apply in a practical situation. And this is also true for buildings. For this reason, simplified models have been proposed in the past, particularly for Mesory buildings, for predicted global box behavior in the case of Mesory buildings, in which still frame models are adopted and the auto plane behavior is ignored. And if we go to Mesory bridge, both simplified and accurate models can be 
adopted in practical engineering, but uh, both models are useful for predictioners. Simplified models can be used for establishing a priority in the evaluation on, on the assessment of real bridges, but accurate models are also needed for a specific uh, a, a punctual assessment of the bridge. So I want to introduce uh, the origin of the strategy that uh, I'm going to present. The strategy uh, has been initially proposed for buildings in which the macro element approach means that uh, the each uh, facade of, of the building, each wall of the building, also interior walls, is subdivided in several macro portions, and each macro portion is represented by an equivalent simplified model. The more spread uh, macro element uh, method for uh, buildings is the so-called equivalent frame models, in the equivalent frame model, a plane masonry wall is uh, represented by beams and columns and uh, rigid links that connect beams and columns. These are nonlinears, and the rigid links uh, connect spandrels and columns. And each of these uh, elements is represent represented by a nonlinear beam. Obviously, this model has uh, a drawback that is uh, the inconsistency in uh, the geometrical layout. And uh, in the rigid links, no damage can occur. And this is not true in, in the reality. So in uh, 2004, starting from uh, an, uh, a thesis that is uh, the thesis of uh, Professor Pantodi that is uh, here with us, it is a thesis for graduation. It, it was not a PhD thesis. We started to think about a different approach. So we thought about a plane mechanical scheme that is just a, an articulated quadrilateral controlled by two nonlinear links and uh, a distribution of nonlinear links in the edge of this quadrilateral articulator, articulator that connect the these. Uh, simple mechanical scheme with the, the other with the, with the, the adjacent elements. Why use a so simplified scheme for modeling mesoly structures? The idea was to model the main plane failure mechanism of a mesoly wall in its own plane. So the rocking can be modeled by proper, properly calibrate the interfaces in which the flexor deformation is slumped. The shear can be properly described by calibrating the two the diagonal or linear links according to the in situ test or to a continuous model. And the sliding can be attributed to a single or linear links that control sliding in, in the element. This idea was implemented in, in a software and uh, the, the approach was followed a discrete element approach, not a finite element approach, because each element uh, has, two, uh, has four degrees of freedom, three related to the rigid body motion, and just one related to the spread shear deformation in, in the element. And so the, uh, this uh, new strategy was a bit different with respect to the frame models, because uh, each part of the mesory can be modeled according to such uh, an easy, simplified approach. Then uh, the calibration fold, uh, followed a, a very simple strategy, a fiber calibration similar to what is uh, currently used for concrete beams. And uh, then uh, it also be extended to distorted, distorted geometry for modeling arches or for modeling the irregular openings in the in the facade. This model has been implemented, as I said, in, com in com commercial software for predictioners. And since the element is consistent geometrically, as we can see here, 
We can also model the interaction between the frame, the concrete, reinforced concrete frame or the steel frame with the inside infill. And so it is also to, to model the infill frame plus infill frame structures using the same approach for measuring. Then uh, during uh, starting from uh, the PhD thesis of Panto, uh, we uh, decided to remove the limitation of the plane model and try to introduce in, in the same macro element both the in-plane and the out-plane behavior. And so we, we gave a third dimension to the, to the macro element in order to model also out-plane behavior and the in-plane behavior. We did it uh, in uh, a new software that is uh, Istra, it's called Istra, and we did some validation of the model with the experimental and the numerical models for modeling the uh, in-plane and the out-plane be behavior of measuring walls. Obviously, now it's needed to, to consider a, bet, a, a, a deeper mesh of the, the, the discretization, but indeed, since each element has only seven degrees of freedom, that are the six degrees of freedom related to the rigid motion, plus the shear deformability, it is a low cost model in terms of computational burden. We use this model to model churches, to model building in which both the in-plane and the out-plane behavior is very important to model. And the, the, the real advantage of this model is the low computational cost and the easiness in the interpretation of the, the numerical results. But this model wasn't able to, to grasp the curvature. So if we have uh, a, a me uh, measuring element that uh, possesses some curvature, the, the, the previous model cannot be adopted. So in another PhD thesis of uh, Professor Francesco Granizzaro, we in the, try to distort distorts the, this model in order to be to introduce a macro element able to model carbon geometric masonry structures. And uh, we followed the, the same approach. So we maintain as the simplicity of the fiber discredit the fiber discretization. We maintain the calibration according to a fiber approach. We maintain the shear deformability in the in the main plane of, of the model, and we started to model carbon geometric structures. The model process still seven degrees of freedom. The, now the geometry, the geometry of the macro element is uh, irregular. The interfaces uh, that connect each element uh, between them are now not orthogonal to the plane or, of the element, but uh, possess uh, uh, a certain angle. And uh, with the same element, we can also with the same element we can also model uh, elements with variable thickness. And uh, in another PhD thesis that uh, has been tutored by Professor Lorenzo Mi of Cesar Chacara, this thesis has, has been conducted at the University of Media and in part and in part at the University of Catania, the model has been extended to two linear dynamic and has been calibrated with a shaking table test on prototypes. We did some comparison with the FM approach. Here we can see a comparison in terms of pressure analysis. Uh, comparing uh, the experimental results, uh, but uh, in particular, we also compared the numerical results using Diana and Distra. The yellow one is uh, the results obtained with the microelement model, considering also the top turning in the constitutive blow, and uh, the the dotted uh, the other curve that is close to the yellow one is has been obtained using Diana. What is important is that in Diana we used 44,000 degrees of freedom, 
the Istra model uh, was characterized by 600 of degrees of freedom. So the computational cost is, is extremely lower. And uh, this model allowed us to do some uh, uh, re uh, re re repetitive analysis also with reference to nonlinear dynamic analysis for uh, generating some uh, fragility curves in uh, some uh, specific uh, prototypes. Here we can see also a comparison between with reference to exactly the same model in the di dynamic context, trying to follow the same constitutive flow with the damage and degradation that uh, has been we, we used in Diana. We use the same constitutive below in a simplified way, a way using the uh, ISTRA, and these are the results in terms of comparison between the two softwares in the dynamic contest. Now we move to uh, uh, Mesory Arch Bridges. Uh, we then decide to. Uh, we, we uh, inside the uh, cooperation with the National Railway System in Italy, in particular in an office in Milan, we decide to, to try to apply this software for Mesory Bridge. But they asked us to create an easy input for the Mesory Bridge, a parametric input to be, to be used in, in their own office. So we, we did it and uh, we I, I'm going to present some, some results in a bridge that, that we model with, with them. This is uh, the results are, are, are in, in this uh, paper that is in Italian. And this is uh, an example of the, I don't know how to start, it will be a video. Probably it doesn't work. It's, it's not a problem. It's a video in which we, we can see how parametric uh, Okay, it's not a problem. Using the, the parametric input, you can implement the geometry and the load condition uh, in uh, in and the entire model of the bridge in uh, very few minutes. Then uh, the you once the model has been generated, you can uh, launch uh, the the nonlinear static control analysis. Then we did a comparison using uh, a nonlinear frame model that is currently used currently used by the National Railway System. That is uh, LUSAS, the well known software on, on linear frame analysis. And uh, first, we did a, vali a validation in the linear contest in, in terms of uh, vibration modes and frequencies. Then, we did uh, a push over analysis, a push down analysis initially in a portion of the, the bridge that uh, is relative to two piers and uh, one arch and uh, other 12 arches. And uh, we compared the results using Plusas uh, and Istra in terms of push down. As, uh, as you can see, there are two, two graphs. The first is uh, a, a comparison between Istra, that is the green one, and Plusas. Ignoring the damage in the shear, because in the macro element model you can separate the the uh, constitutive loss that you at attribute to the shear and the, the, you select for the tensile, the flexural behavior, the membrane behavior. So if we ignore the shear damage in the macro element approach, the two curves are almost the same. If we introduce uh, a shear damage in the in the model that uh, uses the discrete element approach, you can see that the limit load it's a bit lower and uh, there is a bit more ductility. 
So this is uh, an advantage with respect to the FEM approach in which uh, the only possibility to control the shear collapse is by assigning the tensile strength and the fractural energy. In the, in the, in the discrete macroelement approach, you can attribute to different parameters to the membrane behavior and to the and, and then to the tensile strength and to the behavior that control the shear damage. Here we can see another comparison by with the reference to a push down analysis for the old bridge. And uh, these are the comparison of the pushover curves in different control control points of the same of the same bridge. This is uh, another comparison in terms of ultimate compressive stress scenario using the FEM and using the discrete macro element method. And uh, the, the rich value, 10.23 uh, uh, newton over me, uh, megapascal and 10.23 on the FEM are exactly the same in this uh, situation. Here we can see an animation that can be generated easily and that allows to obtain the ultimate loads and the cover curves for different scenario. Uh, recently, we moved also to introduce a simplified modeling of, uh, uh, of bridges in terms of uh, carved railway uh, path. And this is an, an example of uh, a modeling of uh, car, uh, of uh, carbon mesory arch bridge. And uh, in this case, we use the different material for uh, modeling the fill, uh, the, the backfill. We use the friction interface between the backfill and uh, the other structural uh, elements of the bridge and uh, each part of the bridge can be modeled according to different constitutive law. It is important to introduce friction interface between the backfill and the spandrel boards because the, uh, the, the, the cohesion and the friction coefficient between the spandrel wall and the, and the backfill is not the same that uh, uh, you have to use it for the back seal, for the back seal itself. And uh, now the animation is working, I don't know why. This is the, an example of uh, uh, the distribution of damage during the, the movement of the, the train over, over the, the bridge. And uh, to each of these positions is associated a push down. For each push down, you can create, you can evaluate the ductility and the ultimate load. Then uh, you can uh, reconstruct the collapse load multiplier as a function on the load position, and to obtain uh, a, in a in a few hours uh, a, an idea. Not uh, it's not an high fidelity model. It's just a simplified model for practitioners, and uh, uh, you can obtain an uh, a, a representation of the of the ultimate load for different position of the and then you can concentrate in the in the worst condition and the, in the worst condition and then you can uh, analyze it the only the worst condition uh, in, uh, we, we then uh, try to simulate also the influence of uh, retrofitting measures because uh, in practical engineering, it's also important not, to, not only to assess how the bridge behaves, but also to, to think how to retrofit the building if it is needed. So we try to investigate a bridge that is under investigation, is close to Catania, is, this bridge is on the Etna mountain, and is a railway bridge. And this bridge has, has been retrofitted in 1980 because he started to suffer a, a, a small settlement of the central pier, of the central pier. So we tried to, to model 
the bridge in its uh, original configuration and the, a bridge, the bridge in the strength and configuration. The, the, the retrofit that uh, has been used uh, it was uh, represented by steel corrugated thick play uh, with, uh, uh, with the, the introduction of a concrete layer between the, the corrugated play, steel plate and the existing arch. So we model this, uh, this layer using a macro element according to a simple fiber calibration in which we calibrated both the steel and the concrete and we used the, the interaction between the existing arch and the new ring arch. The arch was the new ring arch was founded in a new reinforced concrete foundation that has been also introduced in the model. And uh, here you can see the difference between uh, the, the, the ultimate loads of the of the bridge with the, in uh, considering the different level of the settlement uh, in uh, the in the central piers and the ultimate load of uh, the bridge considering the retrofitting adopted strategy. Here we can see some. Uh, show analysis for lateral loads because uh, uh, this, uh, this bridge is an, an area that is a seismic area, so it's also important to, evolve, to assess the, the bridge against uh, earthquake action. So we, we did some uh, uh, pushover analysis in both the direction, uh, modeling the retrofit and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the bridge in its original configuration. Uh, this is the, the results relative to the load in the direction of the concavity of the, of the bridge. And we reached for the, uh, for the ultimate load for push in uh, horizontal pushover mass proportional, a level of 0 0.75. That means 0 0.75, the weight of the total weight of the bridge. And in the other direction, which we apply the load in the convex part of the curvature, we reach the, a value of almost one in terms of uh, lateral load. That means that uh, I can apply a total lateral load mass proportional for all the bridge that is almost equivalent to its its weight. And uh, now just to, to work on a new macro element that, that is a work in progress. Now we decide to remove the, the limit that the shear deformation in the element that I, I, I have shown is, uh, is only in one, in one plane. And now, now we are working in a new macro element in, we are, in which the shear deformation is uh, in three main plane of the of the element so the macro element is now a, a solid element and so introducing a, a strain field on the volume of the element uh, we obtain now for the basic macro element 90 degrees of freedom the basic solid macro element and uh, the the shear deformation of, uh, uh, has been assigned in the in the regular corresponding uh, is a parametric uh, uh, model and then has been uh, uh, moved to the regular one. Uh, these are some, uh, in order to introduce also the Poisson effect that is very important if we want to model the backfill and if we want to model the soil using the same uh, macro element approach, we also introduce some degrees of freedom that, intro, uh, that allow to us to to account for the Poisson effect, both for dilatation and curvature. And uh, these are the further degrees of freedom that uh, we introduced for, the, for modeling Poisson effects. So the model, the, the solid model can be uh, used, uh, consider a different number of degrees of freedom. 
For example, if you want a rigid model, we have to use just the six degree of freedom because all the deformation is lumped on the interface. If you want to use just the only the shear deformation, we have to consider nine degree of freedom. If we want, if we want to also in, include the Boson effect for dilatation, we have to add the other three degrees of freedom. If we want to introduce also for the Boson effect for curvature, for taking account of the, the effect on curvature, we have to add the other six degrees of freedom. So you can tailor the, the solid element as you like according to your, your needs. We did uh, a first uh, uh, a first comparison in the linear context between the least ether and the new uh, macro element solid, and it's, uh, the results are very, very close to each other. We did uh, some first validation in the linear context uh, with experimental numerical results. Uh, also, in this case, we obtained very good results. So, uh, I can conclude here so I can leave some. Uh, Time for questions. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the speaker. Just got time for one or two very quick questions. Thank you very much. That was a really useful presentation. It, is the intention for this to be a assessment tool in the future in Italy to, to speed up what could be quite a complicated assessment process? Yeah, it is currently used by engineers in Italy. So also the railway system is using uh, the software for a quick assessment of, of some uh, measure structures. 